and I don't have to tell many of you, but we want to just review this, that hidden curriculum, and our panelists will talk a lot about that today, that hidden curriculum on campus that plagues first-generation students. It's really a difficult, difficult one, not knowing who to talk to, not knowing what, who, well, who to seek out, what resources to find. If they go to a particular office and they get turned away, for a reason, where they don't know and they feel sad or concerned because they didn't say something the right way to someone who's an authority. And then they go back and think about it, but never go back to that resource. Uh, all because they're first in the family. How do I navigate the university? You know, a lot of us do things for the first time, and it happens and we kind of get it. Each year at college, as you know, it changes from being a first year, second year, third year, senior. And if you're first in your family, you don't necessarily know what your junior year at college is like. And that's a, that's a difficult challenge for many of our first generation students. And so they need to, they really struggle on navigating the university. And we've seen this time and time again. And there's that idea that they don't learn what happens when they're in K through eight or K through 12 because their families don't necessarily know how to, you know, tell them about that because they haven't been there before. So just important to know some concepts. We'll hear more about that today. Well, my voice isn't loud enough. Wow. I'm just, all right. Can you all hear me? Yeah. All right. Why we created this initiative, Are You First? Well, here at Rutgers, about 30% of students self-identify as first generation, and about 8% of these students are only supported by the state-funded Education Opportunity Fund program, EOF, and our TRIO programs. And so we've learned that there's a lot more support that needs to go around here in New Brunswick campus, and so that's why we decided that we would start to work on this coordinated initiative around campus. I want to give you a snapshot. In no way is this as conclusive or exhaustive data because we are working on that, but we want to give you a snapshot of who our students are, and you can see the racial and ethnic uh, breakdown of first generation students at the latest 2013 cohort. And you can see we are diverse across races in terms of who's first generation, but consistent with the literature, Latino and African Americans still remain in the highest numbers of those students, even here, who identify as first generation. While we on the right side of me is our retention rates. And you'll see, and that's just to give you a snapshot, while they're great, when you look at it, you can see the decline of first-generation students here uh, on campus from year to year. So yes, there's more work to be done. Are You First has key objectives, five key objectives that we're working on right now. Academic support, campus awareness, coordination, high-impact experiences, and training. We have some accomplishments that we want to talk to you a little bit about. Under academic support, we expanded Federal TRIO Student Support Services Grant to serve more first-generation students. We've partnered with many of our undergraduate school deans and academic advising offices to find ways to increase more support for first-generation students. And we worked with our colleagues in the School of Arts and Sciences and our EOF program and Student Support Services to create the RU First Fall Transition Seminar, which students have been transitioning from uh, in the fall to kind of get them, continue to get them acclimated after their summer institutes. As many of you know, we have coordination uh, that we talk about through the RU First Alliances, which are comprised of faculty, staff, and administrators of key offices, financial aid, accounting, residence life, key offices of student affairs, to find how we can to talk about best practices or apply best practices to our service and eliminate service gaps that might negatively impact our first generation students. Recently, we partnered with the Registrar, Enrollment Management, and Institutional Research to create an indicator so that we get, a better, uh, get better data on who our students are, who are first generation in the student records database, as well as changing some questions on the admissions application so that we can get this data up to speed as soon as possible. Last year, and well this year rather, we had our annual first generation college celebration in terms of campus awareness, where we celebrate our first generation student success and make students aware of our resources. This was joined with the Council of Opportunity Education and NASPA. We also joined the I'm First, uh, and that should be lighter, but I'm First.org platform. It's a national online community where not only do students on campus can find resources and talk to other students who are first generation, but they can talk to other students at other campuses and universities. We now have an active website, rufirst.ruckers.edu, and we created a first generation landing page working with the undergraduate admissions department. So where students can actually come when they're thinking about Rutgers or visiting Rutgers and say, hey, is this the place for me? I'm first in my family. Well, now they can go when they look at our website and see this wonderful page about first generation or first generation Rutgers about the things that 
we offer and who we are and why we support first generation students and we are to, uh, you know, worry about their success. Other accomplishments that we're proud of is, uh, and, we, and, and, and this one in particular, is our high impact experiences. One of the things that we're doing this fall is we're going to be sending mailing home to all families and students to encourage more students, particularly first generation students, to take the first year burn seminars. We know that we need to have more to connect them to faculty. We worked this year over the past two years to have a number of faculty make specialized burns to target first generation students. So we are definitely seeing an increase in uh, ways that first-generation students are connected with, our fa uh, with their faculty. This year will be the third year of the Chancellor's Study Abroad uh, Scholarship for uh, first-generation students, and we partnered with RU Global, or Rutgers Global, by where students can go across the country, place, across the world, places that they've never been before, and we work with them to get their passports and have many break experiences by where students uh, can visit for the first time, and we have some of those students here today. Training. Well, you're here today, so we are doing a community program where we have best, we'll discuss best practices and have experts and practitioners talk about how to work with first generation students, and that's one of the initiatives we're here today. This is our third forum, and we're also working on developing a number of online and in person faculty and staff training modules so that our team can work with all of the units to work, talk about, or discuss best practices. And discuss ways that we can support first generation students in different disciplines and schools across our campus. One of the things that we're very proud of, and we have some of our scholars here today, is our Paul Robeson Leadership Institute. It's a pilot program in its fourth cohort, and it's targeted at first generation underrepresented males. And really, it is a 14-day summer bridge program to get them prepared for college in the fall, connect them back to the life and legacy of Paul Robeson, and give them the skills necessary they need to be successful in their school or discipline of choice. And for that, they get an academic advisor until they graduate, they receive college credit, they get a book stipend, and uh, they have a lot of other opportunities. And we've been successful. We have about 100 students, uh, Mr. Moore and Ms. Jones. I think 96 of them are here. They're doing well, and they're representing Rutgers well year to year. So we haven't lost them. So we're proud of that. And uh, we're hoping to have another cohort of students this summer. Future goals, and we're working with many, of, many folks across the campus and in the audience, is to develop a first generation new student uh, orientation priority session. We're going to have a open house for first generation admitted students. And two days before school starts, student support services will be leading a student success conference to target 150 first generation low income students to prepare them right before school uh, so that they can make the transition easier into our community uh, in the fall semester. And I talked about the fourth cohort. Some of the other things we want to see happen is begin to work on an annual report for first generation students so that the community and leadership can see how we're doing, what data is out there. Uh, we want to continue to work on improving data and service delivery because uh, we need to do better at that. I think that we want to know who the students are, where they come, how they're doing, and get to that a little bit more, a little quicker than we have in the past. And so we're going to work as a team to do that. And then the, uh, one of the biggest things here is going to be a one-stop online directory of all the resources called the RU First directory, modeled after what you know, enrollment and others had put together in the precollege.ruckers.edu. It'll be RU First edu, if you will, where a student can come to college and they can put in their keyword, what level they are, and find out what resources that are available to them. And so what that would mean is every school and unit we're going to be working with, if you have something in your school or unit or something that you want to support first generation student, underrepresented students, low income students, or it'll be open to all students, it'll be a one stop clearinghouse, or if you will, where all the information is housed. So that way we don't, when students say, I can't find the information, they're able to uh, find it quickly by visiting this directory, and we'll do our best to keep that updated and get it out to the community. And so our website is rufirst.ruckers.edu. That's, uh, that's our presentation. Uh, it is very important that we note that if we want to continue to retain our students 
and we want to aspire to be like our peers and do all of the things that uh, we want to do here at Rutgers. You know, I'm a, a first-generation EOF student. I've been here. I'm a success, as, as I believe it, because Rutgers has been a home for me, and it's been successful to many of us that are in the room. I see some of my colleagues who have always also experienced this. Uh, it's something to be proud of. First-generation students is a point of pride. And I think it's important that we continue to coordinate across campus. However, it won't be successful if all of you are not buying in and we're not continuing to close the service gaps and not working with our deans, our leaders, and our students to help them understand the importance of first-generation students and why they need to be successful. If we got 30% and we want to close the gaps and raise our graduation retention rates, this is the way to do it. So that's my presentation. I want to thank you for listening. Certainly, we open. If you have more, uh, we'll talk you know, in the future. Thank you. I would now like to introduce our leader and chancellor, Christopher J. Malloy. Chancellor uh, Malloy previously served as Rutgers University Senior Vice President for Research and Economic Development. He is responsible for both charting the university's future and leading the day-to-day -day operations of the Rutgers flagship. Chancellor Malloy has been part of the university's community since his days as a pharmacy student in the 1970s, receiving an undergraduate and professional degree from Rutgers. He has previously served with distinction as Dean of the Ernest Mario School of Pharmacy, Interim Provost for Biomedical and Health Sciences during the integration of the former UMDNJ into Rutgers and the Interim Chancellors of Rutgers Biomedical and Health Sciences. Chancellor Major Malloy addressed the community state in Rutgers, New Brunswick as a place of big ideas, balanced energies, and unlimited potential. Chancellor Malloy, everybody. <laughs> I have to read it. I think you have it. There you go. Boy, you overdid that, huh? <laughs> Good morning, everybody. And it is a great pleasure for me to be here. And, th and the reason is, despite all of what James just said, which is a uh, little over the top, I'm actually a first generation Rutgers student. And I know it's hard to believe back in the 70s when tuitions were low and we didn't need all the, necessarily all the financial support. But I certainly wasn't able to come here. My parents, my father was a, was a Marine Corps veteran from the Korean War, and he never went to college. He worked for public service for 38 years. And my mom uh, was from Brooklyn, and uh, <clears throat> they couldn't afford to send me to any college. So I had to look at our state university. Of course, tuition at the time was a very small fraction of what it is today. So it's really amazing. And we didn't have any of the support, uh, support that we had uh, that James just outlined, which is spectacular. And I'm extremely supportive of RU First, James, and what you're doing in student equity and, and, and educational equity. Um, but I, I really do want to welcome you all to here today because this is really a great forum. Um, Are you first forum brings together experts to share best practices to increase retention and four-year graduation rates of students who are first generation. And what we need in this country is more college-educated students who really have a broad background. And, and these first generation are key to this country's success, quite frankly. I want to thank each panelist for agreeing to participate in the forum. Zakia Smith-Ellis, the New Jersey Secretary of Higher Education. Hi, Zakia. Our distinguished guest today. VJ Pendeker, Dean of Students at Cornell. VJ. Eugene Anderson, Vice President, Office of Access and Success at the a APLU. Courtney Mackinoff, one of Rutgers' top employees, our Vice Chancellor for Enrollment Management at Rutgers University, New Brunswick. And Takanda Musa, Class of 2020, School of Arts and Sciences Scholar. Where's Takanda? The conversations that you'll have today and throughout the week are necessary as about 30% of our students are first generation. Uh, the Student Access and Equity, uh, Educational Equity Group coordinates such a, things such as RU First, EOF, opportunities for students to have successful personal, professional, academic and social experiences at this university. It's more and more important as, as we've evolved from the time I was an undergrad where things are a little bit sleepy here at Rutgers and you had a lot more personal touches to some of these activities that first generation need to, for support. College is very expensive. There's a lot of social pressures on, on having jobs and, and, and staying in college. It's really critically important for this university to pay attention to that and to make sure that we give access to these to students and have them graduate and become citizens of this country that, uh, quite frankly, I have a tremendous amount of optimism for despite all the pr press we see every day. So I want to thank you all for coming today. Thank you for inviting me. And en enjoy the forum. And welcome to Rutgers.
again, thank you, Chancellor Malloy, and uh, thank you all. So as we continue, uh, then what we're next we're going to do now is bring up a student, uh, and I'm going to read a little bit of her bio. She is a Newark native and Douglas woman. See, look at that. Natasha Amazor Sanchez is a junior at Rutgers University, New Brunswick, with intentions of double major in history and political science and minoring in Africana studies. She splits her time between working in, at the anthropology department, serving as a peer mentor coordinator for student support services, while also mentoring two first year students and providing public access training to service dogs with the Companion Animal Club. Natasha is a Paul Robeson ambassador for the inaugural cohort of Paul Robeson Leadership Institute and received the first Chancellor's Are You First Study Abroad scholarship in 2017 as a School of Arts and Sciences School of Arts and Sciences Honors Program student, she earned the School of Arts and Sciences Excellence Awards both in 2017 and 2018. Her research paper, Civil Disobedience and the First Amendment, The Subjective Constitutional Validity, was published in the 12th volume of Dialogues at RU and was awarded the Outstanding Research Writing Project completed by a student in the research disciplines at the 2018 Undergraduate Research Conference. After graduation, Natasha wants to attend law school. She is aspiring to become a defense attorney and someday work her way up to being a judge. Join me in bringing up Natasha Almazar Sanchez. Thank you. Well, I sound great on paper. <laughs> All right. So I want to share you guys um, something that I'm going through right now. I'm currently in the middle of reading Supreme Court Justice um, Sonia Sotomayor's memoir, My Beloved World. I was actually given this book freshman year by a dean on Douglas um, as a token to inspire me to, to continue my law aspirations and to educate me on the upbringing of a woman who has a similar background. Um, I know what you're thinking. If I got this book two years ago, why did it take me two years to read a biography? And the thing is, is that I kept telling myself I didn't have time. Um, I actually started the book a month ago while I was interning at a law firm in New York City. And I felt like this was the time, like I had time and I wanted to do it. Um, I kept telling myself before that, I need to do this first, I need to do that. But what I'm realizing as I inch towards the end of my ed undergraduate education here is that I don't necessarily have to do anything, I don't need to do anything. Instead, this constant sense of urgency I felt before was a pressurized, guilt-motivated, uphill battle for success, or a sense of bliss that I see a lot also in other first-generation students, like Justice Sotomayor, because they're trying to satisfy these agendas from their parents, from professors, from institutions. Statistics are thrown at you as soon as an institution learns of your first-generation stud um, first student status. 48 of first-generation students attended college part-time. Only 11% of low-income first-generation students have a college degree within six, year, six years of enrolling. 36% of first-generation students in their first or second year um, reported taking a remedial class. And these are all statistics from the Post-Secondary National Policy Institute. So that's scary. Um, no one wants to be told that you're just a number or that you're part of a number. Or worse, prove a negative statistic right. Because then you feel that if you do something bad, if you do fail, it's because you're first generation. And that's not the case. Um, that's how I felt my freshman year. So what was my solution? Well, as my friends say, I was a tad bit extra. Um, uh, I was advised by uh, my advisors to take 12 credits um, my freshman year, you know, so I don't, over ooh, so I don't overwhelm myself. I was also advised to save extracurricular activities and um, being active for um, sophomore year so I can become accustomed to Rutgers. That's not what I did. Um, I don't like to be told not to do something because that makes me want to do it more. <laughs> so instead, by the end of my freshman year, I had 34.5 degree credits. I went to Washington DC for four days in the middle of October to a women in law retreat. I worked two jobs. I interned as a mentor in an after-school middle school program and somehow managed to end with the 3.7. And don't clap, don't. 
that sounds great on paper, but it was extremely stressful. I was trying so hard to prove statistics that I was competent. I was trying to prove to my mom that I'm not taking this opportunity for granted. On one hand, I was scared of failing, and on the other hand, I was scared I wasn't doing enough. I learned a few years back that my mom wanted to be an architect, but she let that aspiration go because she wasn't able to complete high school um, in the Dominican Republic. And getting a GED here in the United States isn't easy when English is your second language and um, GED programs waitlist at county colleges start at a minimum of a year. So she let that go. And so for a while I felt guilty because here I am at Rutgers University, New Brunswick with all these programs surrounding me, helping me to do stuff that my mom didn't have. Even though these programs do have the slight tendency to throw these scary numbers at you, like five minutes ago, <laughs> but I understand why. It's not to tell you that you are a number, it's to tell you to not be a number, that you're not a part of the statistics. The Are You First initiative granted me the opportunity to study art history in Paris, France, something I could not imagine. Student Support Services gave me my first LSAT prep book. The Paul Robeson Leadership Institute gave me my first university scholarship and my first leadership role here at Rutgers when I became an ambassador. The more involved I stayed with these programs, the more pressure and guilt, the more the pressure, the guilt, and the guilt started to fade, and I need turned into I want. I want to study at the library at nine o'clock at night. I want to mentor freshmen in my free time. I want to go to law school. I want to graduate from Rutgers University. I want to share also this quote with my first fellow first generation students um, and also supporters of first generation students. As Justice Sotomayor said in her memoir, experience has taught me that you cannot value dreams according to the odds of their coming true. Their real value is in stirring within us the will to aspire. That will, wherever it finally leads, does at least move you forward. And after time, you may recognize that the proper measure of success is now how much you've closed the distance to some far off goal, but the quality of the work you've done today. Thank you. Isn't she great? Let's give her another round of applause. And there are so many more students like it. You know, Rutgers, we, this is a great place. And we should be proud of our diversity and excellence, but we should build on that. 50 years of the EOF program this year, 50 years of TRIO yesterday, we had 250 high school students here to kick off Access Week as we prepared them to get them motivated about going to college and our Upward Bound program that celebrated 53 years. And now we're on our, uh, you know, this pilot initiative that has been working across campus. So we've been doing what we set out to do, and we're going to continue that with the support of all of you. Uh, and our leadership. And again, we want to thank the chancellor and all of the cabinet members that are here today and our leadership and colleagues for supporting this. Uh, at this time, we're going to ask you to uh, get a few refreshments for five to seven minutes, and we're going to let the panelists start to make their way up to the stage while the Student Center uh, gets uh, set up. Thank you. I want to thank everyone for being here. As part two, as we get ready to go through this morning, it, this is what it's all about. We have these fine, distinguished guests that are here that are going to present our RU First panel. But to do that, um, I'm going to introduce uh, a colleague and friend that will uh, be presiding over this next part. Dr. Janice Saab is currently the Assistant Dean and Director of the EOF at Rutgers New Brunswick Program of School in Environmental and Biological Sciences. Janice is a former EOF student graduating from Rutgers University, Cook College, with a Bachelor of Science in Economics in, in Seton Hall University, Paul W. Stillman School of Business. She has an MBA in Finance. She earned her Doctorate of Education here at Rutgers Graduate School of Education, where her dissertation focused on the potential influence of pedagogical practices on first-year student success in introductory chemistry courses. Dr. Saab has worked with opportunity programs for more than 30 years. Using a progressive network of services, Dr. Saab seeks to unmask myths and highlights the benefit of scientific research to encourage students to consider doctoral studies. Understanding the personal desires of students who are marginalized by a society that uses assessment and finances to determine access and opportunity, 
Dr. Saab uses her research to inform academic and administrative policies by including student voices to create an academic pedagogy to enhance learning outcomes for science students. Dr. Saab is an advocate for education. She has delivered presentations at regional and national conferences focused on excellence and best practice in post-secondary education. Janice has also written grants to fund academic initiatives that promote STEM education, higher education. Dr. Saab is a recipient of the Rutgers SEBS NJES Staff Excellence Award, George H. Cook Distinguished Alumni Award, and labors to enhance the educational experience for all students. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in introducing Dr. Janice Saab, who will moderate our panel. Thank you. I'm like Natasha, that doesn't sound like me. Okay. All right, welcome everyone. Welcome to the Are You First Forum. I have the distinct pleasure of introducing to you our panelists for today. Um, to my far right, I have Dr. Eugene L. Anderson, who is the Vice President for the Vice President for Office uh, for the Office of Access and Success, um, Association of Public and Land Grant Universities, APLU. And then I have Dr. Vijay um, Pendekar. He is the Dean of Students at Cornell University. And then I have Dr. Zakia Smith-Ellis, who is New Jersey Secretary of Higher Education. And then I have uh, Mr. Courtney Mackinac. He is the Vice Chancellor of Enrollment Management at Rutgers University, New Brunswick, our flagship. And then I have Mr. Tekadwa, um, Tekadwa um, Musa. He's a student in Arts and Sciences class of 2020. So we're going to start off this panel with a discussion, a couple of questions that we have for our panelists, and then we'll open it up for questions and answers from our audience here. So my first question is for my panelists um, to tell the audience a little bit about yourself and your involvement in supporting first-generation students through active practice or research or being a first-generation student yourself. So we'll start with um, Dr. Anderson. Good morning, everyone. Morning. Really excited to be here on this panel. I, I consider myself a part of the Rutgers extended family. Uh, I have a cousin who graduated from here back in 2001, was a member of Coach Stringer's first Final Four basketball team. So I had many trips up here to the rack to cheer on the Scarlet Knights and continue to be a big fan to this day. I'm originally from Ohio, and one of the things that's important to know about me is that I'm a first-generation college graduate. My mother and uncle went to college but didn't finish. And so my whole childhood actually gave me an up-close understanding of the challenges when you don't finish college because we struggled financially. We lived paycheck to paycheck because my mother wasn't able to get the kind of job she would have if she had finished her degree. So on one hand, that provided me both an understanding and a motivation to go to college and finish, but it also created a lot of uneasiness in me because my mother was the smartest, hardest working person that I knew. So the fact that she didn't finish college because of financial issues and life challenges made it clear to me that it took something more than just being smart and working hard. So that experience both encouraged me but always created that sense of unease that I will say honestly existed in the pit of my stomach until the day I walked across that stage. Uh, came to Philadelphia, I'm from Cincinnati, Ohio, came to Philadelphia for college, started at Temple, and then transferred to Penn and graduated from University of Pennsylvania, and then went on to graduate school at the University of Virginia, earning a master's and doctorate in education policy. Uh, at APLU, I head up the Office of Access and Success, and so in that role, uh, I work with institutions like Rutgers, they're one of our members, we have 235 members, primarily large public research institutions. 
I work with all those institutions around issues of access and equity. And I also work with our 19 land-grant HBCU institutions who, as, as many of you I'm sure know, uh, from their very founding uh, fa have been committed to providing access and opportunity. Uh, a lot of great work is happening on campuses like Rutgers, so from my perspective, my role is being a bridge and a link. We do a lot of professional development, providing a forum for great practices like what you all are doing to be featured and, and others to learn from those efforts. Uh, and then also we research questions that need to be answered so that the community can better understand the continued challenges around access and equity. Uh, and we do a lot of advocacy at the federal level for funding on access and equity. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, my name is Vijay Pendakur. I currently serve as the Dean of Students at Cornell University. Um, so my, my pathway to uh, working on issues of first-gen student empowerment and student success was somewhat circuitous. I, I started my journey in higher education really focused on issues of multiculturalism, social justice, and um, identity development. Uh, as a student affairs practitioner, I'm really keenly interested in how young people come of age, and particularly people of color, uh, queer community members, um, and other folks from marginalized groups. And so uh, my first many years in the field uh, were as a diversity educator and a social justice, social justice educator working on curriculum design and pedagogical interventions to help young people think about their own identity in more complex ways and to um, engage uh, privileged group members in an understanding of power and privilege and oppression. Um, and slowly came through that space to, uh, to work on student success issues um, and noticed many overlaps, right, between the identity development work we were doing in cultural and identity resource centers and the ways in which uh, partners on the student success side of the house were trying to uh, empower students uh, who were the first in their family to come to college and face numerous economic challenges to navigate through to graduation. And my research and practice areas in the last five or six years have focused on the intersection between uh, the, the critical multiculturalist world and the student success world, which too often are separate worlds in, in the literature. And I think that our students who live at the nexus of uh, multiple identities suffer because the literature is currently bifurcated. Um, and uh, on a personal level, my, my own journey towards really being passionate and committed around first-gen student success issues comes from um, in some ways, the other side of the experience. I, I grew up with the tremendous privilege of not being a first-generation college student. My, my father is a university professor. And what became really apparent to me, and you'll hear the term, we, we're gonna use it in the panel today, the hidden curriculum. Um, the hidden curriculum was not hidden to me um, because I had a parent, I was fortunate enough to have a parent from the moment I matriculated to college saying, here's exactly how you do this. Here's exactly how you be successful in pursuing your baccalaureate degree. When I went to graduate school, the, the blueprint was made naked for me, right? It was not hidden. It was, it was uh, as illuminated as it possibly could be having a university professor as a parent. And so when I started to work with first-gen students more intentionally, the dissonance between my own experience and all of the things that were quote unquote obvious to me and what was not obvious to them really uh, uh, was alarming and uh, motivating for me to say, we, we have an equity issue, we have a justice issue here, and um, institutions uh, cannot rest on their access laurels. We have to be equally committed to equity investments uh, so that we actually not just admit students, but empower them through to successful graduation. And, and so I'm really excited for this panel today, and I'm grateful for you for coming and for being part of the experience. Um, so I will uh, jump off the last point that Vijay just mentioned. So I am uh, the Secretary of Higher Education now, and I will say, and I've said to audiences before, and I'm sure if she were here right now, she would agree that my grandmother, who was a college graduate, was extraordinarily disappointed in me when I chose this path. <laughs> because as a black woman in South Carolina who went to college in the 1950s before the Higher Education Act was passed, she felt like she had to go, and she did have to go through a lot to get to where she was. And she was a teacher because as a black woman in South Carolina in the 1950s, that's pretty much all you could do after you went to Morris College, which was the only college 
in the area that was available to her as a historically black college in Sumter, South Carolina. Um, and so she was just saddened when I said I wanted to be a teacher. She was like, oh my God, I, I, had, I had, you know, you're my grandchild, I went to college, this was like the top of the ladder, and you do the same thing, like why can't you be a lawyer, why can't you be, you know, just some, anything else. Um, but the thing that always uh, drew me to education um, was that I realized talent is evenly distributed, but opportunity is not. And so the fact that, you know, I had a mother, a grandmother, a father who went to college and went through these obstacles and had the ability to say, this is going to be your path. And I had classmates, cousins, um, other people who I knew personally, who I felt like were just as smart as me, um, just and even smarter, but just didn't have the same opportunities that I had. That just felt extraordinarily unjust. And when I look at, particularly now, what's happening at the federal level and the people who get positions of power, I know for sure <laughs> that opportunity is not uh, evenly distributed and that, um, that there are so much untapped talent in the world. And I just think about how worse we are as a country because we have set up systems that allow people who have extraordinary potential to be um, kind of excluded from opportunity. And that just, that path frightens me. That's like what keeps me up at night. The fact that we have so many people who have so much potential and that's why I do what I do because I really don't think we're gonna make it if we continue to lock people out of opportunity. Uh, and particularly if, I won't say more about federal policy right now. Eugene and I worked in DC before together, but, um, but I will just keep it at that and maybe a little bit more. But the, the policy angle, I so I somehow ended up from teaching to policy, which is a longer story, but I really enjoy um, uh, that intersection and uh, work every day to kind of make those opportunities more available. Well, good morning. I, I think one thing we have in common are uh, parents who were pretty suggestive. Not, my, my mother did not uh, finish high school, but she knew I was going to do well. Uh, she was a very mean woman. Uh, <laughs> Short, 5'1", uh, uh, and pretty much dictated that I would get on a train in New York for an hour and a half every morning to go to Brooklyn Technical High School, which I did not want to do, but I'm so eternally grateful for her for making me do that and really changing my outcomes. Mm -hmm. Growing up in New York City, my whole world did end at the Hudson River. I know if you've seen that map, there was no Newark, there was no Pittsburgh, there was no Chicago. Everything was there. I never, never spoke to a high school counselor, even at a selective magnet high school. I had no idea about colleges or the opportunities that would be available for me. I picked City College of New York because my friend picked City College of New York, and that was the only reason I didn't realize there were scholarships, I didn't realize opportunities. And that's kind of become my passion to make sure that other students uh, with, with similar backgrounds have more opportunities, understand the capacity that they have and the breadth and scope of the colleges. I'm, I'm also really proud to be here at Rutgers. You know, this is a very gritty campus. The students are extremely gritty. A third of our students here are on Pell Grants. Imagine that, over 30% are within 40% of the p federal poverty level, yet still even though we looked at the numbers and sometimes depressed by them, we have an 81% graduation rate, which tells a story of how hardworking the students at Rutgers are. Most of them have jobs on and off campus, but they still manage to do very well and compete. But we can do better, right? We, we need to become the national prototype. I see Eve Sachs here, and a program that I'm really proud of that we have is Rutgers Future Scholars. Uh, we take 200 now and 15 seventh graders whose families are in low income situations. And you heard one this morning, Natasha, who came through Future Scholars and uh, bring them to campus every summer for up to six weeks starting in seventh grade. Uh, it is not a special admission program. They have to earn their way into Rutgers. And you can see they're brilliant. What really upsets me about Future Scholars is that we pick 215 kids. There are literally thousands of kids that we should have been able to pick for future scholars. We just can't afford it. And so um, that's a sin. I mean, we can afford, I, I said no politics, but we can afford 20 billion for a wall. We should be able to, to find a way 
to provide opportunities for these kids. And so uh, that's something <laughs> that I, I know we can resolve around because if they are educated, all the other conditions start to decrease. Poverty, public housing, Medicaid, crime. You know, it's, it's such a no-brainer. And we have these great institutions here in the state of New Jersey and, and places like Rutgers. We just need to be resourced and make it happen. Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Takondo Musa, and I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a junior here at Rutgers University. And what I can say I do have in common with everybody here on this panel is the fact that my parents at home have always wanted me to achieve success. And that stemmed from even my grandmother in Malawi. So this past summer, I was a part of the Ronald E. McNair post baccalaureate Achievement Program. <laughs> and this program was very pivotal to my, success, my academic success here at Rutgers because I got to conduct preliminary research on a topic that's very dear to my heart. And what I, was, what I was investigating was trade versus aid in Southern African regions in terms of accomplishing economic sustainability. And being that I'm from Malawi, a Southern African country, last year I, I traveled to Malawi and saw all this strife firsthand. And what I, what I set out to do after, after, after my visit was that I, I should be and I have to be the change I want to see in this world. Because oftentimes there's, there's, there's a lot of, thank you, thank you. There's a lot of issues in this world and you can't take on everything, you can't take on all the problems, but you should definitely take on something that you have, you have heart in and that, that uh, day, day after day, even throughout the hard days, it'll make you go back and wake up and go at it harder. That's all I have. Thank you. Well, listening to everyone, I hear the passion about um, first generation students and I also hear that we must do better. Okay, so my next question is, um, what do you perceive to be some of the critical issues facing our low income and first generation students today? Don't you have the mic? Oh. No. oh. <laughs> I, I can start, you know, uh, for us, if we, if we look at it from a perspective of say Rutgers University, it's academic preparedness. Um, we need to get more students in the right sequence of classes to get admitted to schools like Rutgers. You know, we have, especially in some of the urban areas, the graduation rates are not where they're supposed to be. And then the students that do graduate, many haven't taken a rigorous enough curriculum to get to institutions that use SATs and ACT exams as a basis for admission. And so starting in, in, in ninth grade, really to get the students to understand the process of what it takes academically uh, to, to get into four-year universities, I think is, is a critical from an access point. And it's also equally important that they have those courses so that when they get into these institutions, they can compete. That it's not a matter of intellect or ability, it's really a matter of guidance. They're all smart. They're all smart. They just have to be given the, the right set of skills and the right set of prep. And, and we see that here every day and how much potential there is on this campus, uh, students to have been given the path to get in the right way. Well, I would just add to that and say affordability. That's what I think um, hugely, just every single time we talk to students and I would, um, I can't stress it enough, even though we have financial aid that we think is generous, it tends to not be enough um, almost for anyone that has any financial need. And it's not just the tuition and fees, because even after you cover tuition and fees, you have to live somehow. You have to have, you stay on campus, you have to pay what you call room and board. If you're not on campus, you gotta pay your rent. You gotta eat. And the level of housing insecurity that we're seeing among college students today, the level of food insecurity, people that are not sure whether where their next meal is gonna come from. There's a fantastic book that I would recommend to anybody. Not, I can't remember where the young woman is that was talking about having books recommended you know, that you don't have time to read. But um, Scarcity was a book from a couple of economists a few years back. It just talks about how your brain actually functions differently when you don't know where you're going to, when your physical needs aren't met. And if you're a student of, um, 
uh, education, Maslow's hierarchy of needs, right? If you can't eat, if you're physically, like this is why we have free lunch in, in high school and in elementary school because we know students can't concentrate if they're hungry, um, if they're physical, if, you're not, if you don't feel safe, if you are not sure like in your home environment that you are gonna be safe from physical harm, it changes the way you think. Um, and so I just, we don't, when we talk about affordability, those are issues of affordability in as much as are you going to be able to register for classes because your tuition and fees is paid. And um, I think sometimes we think because we have covered a scholarship that covers tuition and fees that therefore those other issues are met and they are not. Um, and this is why our students are working two and three jobs. If you work that much, when are you supposed to study as well? And so that's another piece of this, that there's a lot of new research coming out about housing insecurity, food insecurity and just these other factors, but I would just encourage us to think about those pieces, and I see that just so often. Anytime I talk to a student themselves, they will say, yeah, affordability in one of these ways is something that's preventing me from, from succeeding. Um, just, I couldn't agree more with the sentiments my fellow panelists have shared thus far. I, I think for me, when I think about the challenges facing first-gen students, um, many of whom identify as low-income in our nation as well, um, I. Uh, there are so many things, but I'll choose to share some remarks that try and shift the locus of the problem off of the students themselves and onto the institution. So um, in rooms where I get to serve as an advocate or an educator on these issues, I have tried in the last few years to instill a, uh, the frame of equity-minded design. And so for, for those of you in the room who work with students and have control over some aspect of the student experience, whether that be an orientation program, or an academic advising unit, or a, a single course that you teach, or uh, the entire enrollment management funnel. Um, the, the question I think higher ed needs to be asking is an existential question. Who were we designed for? And uh, at, from its roots, higher education is the product of what we would term industrial design. It wasn't actually designed with an end user in mind. Um, it wasn't designed around the student experience. It was designed around a number of other experiences, and we hope students will be successful. Um, you know, the, we've been part of a viral conversation around college completion for over a decade now in our industry. But if you look at the longitudinal completion rates, uh, we, it, the, the, the graduation rates tell a story of an industry that has been woefully inadequate in asking the question, are we student ready? And rather, we have this sleight of hand where we only ask the question, are the students college ready? And so part of what we have to do as change agents is to challenge our institutions, challenge the, you know, if you're not, where, depending, no matter where you are in, in the org chart, to challenge your program, your department, your office, to think about design. Who are your students and are your practices from the bottom up actually designed around the reality of who your students are? How are their identities being taken, taken into account in the way that you engage them in your pedagogy, in your curriculum, in your um, onboarding practices, um, in your residence halls, in your leadership development programs? And if these things are identity neutral, then they are likely not working for low-income first-gen students. They're likely not working for low-social capital students. They're likely not working for students of color and queer community members, undocumented students, people with disabilities. The list goes on and on, right? So I think that um, an equity frame um, and a design strategy has to be the next pivot for higher education if we're ever gonna move the needle in a substantive way on, the, on, on completion rates. Um, and, uh, and that's gonna be a, a, a fundamental shift for our industry. And I'll just add to the financial piece. I think one of the critical issues, because uh, there's so much financial need for, for low-income students, first-generation students, they are struggling trying to balance so many roles, both as student and earner and provider. Earner and provider. They have to work to take care of themselves. They may also need to help contribute to the family. And part of being student-centered uh, is understanding that challenge and the burden that places on the student and the decisions that they have to make and how we can, as institutions, support them and help guide them through uh, those, those choices. It's easy to stand back from an advising standpoint and tell the student, oh, well, you know, you, you shouldn't work uh, this other job because you've got this full course load. 
but they know what other option do they have. Uh, how else are they going to have food? How else are they going to pay rent? How else are they going to uh, help the family uh, back home? And so we, we have to figure out how to provide the guidance that is oriented towards the situation of those students and helping them think about how they can navigate this while other students are just navigating classes, extracurricular activities, and social activities, uh, low-income students, by the virtue of being low-income, have to navigate so many more things. And so I think as that's a critical challenge, and we as institutions have to continue to evolve so we can do a better job at supporting and helping to guide those. And just to build off what Dr. Vijay had mentioned, there needs to be a lot more emphasis on mentorship and advising like in all colleges really, because coming in as a freshman, I wasn't sure at all what I wanted to do. I just, <laughs> I just knew that I'm in college now and somehow I have to figure out a major within these, ne within these next few semesters. And that was challenging, but after, and I was in the Paul Ropes and Live and Learning community, so I got a chance to meet Dr. Whitney, Dr. Ramsami early on, and they helped and they were my safety net, and they helped me, you know, cancel some things out and figure out what path to take. And had it not been for people like them and, you know, people they led me to, I, I wouldn't be where I'm at right now. And, yeah, there just needs to be more emphasis on mentorship and going to office hours, meeting people like Dr. Goldman in the audience, and they, they really made all the difference in, in terms of my story. So as you heard from my introduction, I, I'm really interested in student voices and what the students are saying. And, and the panel actually gave us a little bit about student level influences as well as institutional level influences. And that's important. Um, one of the next questions I wanted to ask pretty deals with the institutional level. And um, it asks, can you explain what the hidden curriculum is? And we, we saw that earlier today of higher education uh, what that is, and how do we, staff, administrators, faculty, all of us in the room, actually support first-generation students through the hidden curriculum? Sure. <laughs> so one of the challenges with, with the hidden curriculum is, one, uh, the awareness and two, the financial reality that the hidden curriculum, in part because it's hidden, is not actually paid for. And so you can do things to help students understand about the hidden curriculum, those who um, might not benefit from having parents or peers or other relatives who have navigated college and can impart that roadmap, uh, but that still doesn't pay for it. And I think that's a, to me, that's an important part of the hidden curriculum uh, that we have to address so that students not only know about it, but can participate. And for me, the best example is part of the hidden curriculum, and those of us who eventually have gone through college and are working on campuses know, you need to do more than just get your degree, right? right. You need to do internships, summer programs, uh, even study abroad is, is proven to be very beneficial. Now, a lot of institutions have pooled resources to provide travel support for students to be able to, to go to different cities and even different countries. But if there's not an additional stipend for some of these programs that can make up for lost income, then a low-income student may not be able to participate, even if they know that, oh, that's really important to my education and my career preparation. But the summers are when I can earn the most money. The financial aid act office is actually expecting me to come back <laughs> at the end of the summer and hand them over a check. So it's great that I got this scholarship to pay for me to go to France or Japan and, or Africa and study. 
but I can't afford to not earn the money that I would earn back home. So there's that financial piece again, and it really is. And you mentioned, you know, where are we putting our money at the federal level? We certainly can get into it because these things, they cost, but they are investments that there's research that shows they're worth it, and we just have to continue to push, and this is what APLU and other associations and foundations like Lumina do, is to continue to push the point at the uh, federal level that the investment is well worth the return. Um, so I'll focus my comments on, um, on a pedagogical uh, approach. So uh, oftentimes, those of us in the room who are working with first-gen students and low-income students, when we're, uh, we're, we're really trying to rush in very quickly and make sure that we fill social capital gaps that might serve as a barrier, right, to them successfully navigating the collegiate experience, whether that be in the space of career navigation, academic navigation, um, uh, how to sit at the front of the classroom, right, you know, introduce yourself to your professors, right, there. this is part of how we're making visible the hidden curriculum of student success. Um, how we do this is critically important, and I want to go back to uh, elements of what I heard uh, Nat Natasha Sharon in her uh, really brilliant uh, remarks before the panel started. Um, if we do this in a way that embodies a deficit lens, uh, meaning if we do this in a way that the meta communication is, you're broken, right? There's something wrong with you, and so we're going to fill your brokenness so that you can be successful here then it robs students of their agency, their resilience, their self-efficacy, their grit, um, before they start what might be the hardest chapter in their life thus far. So centering an asset lens in the work that we're doing with low-income and first-generation students is critically important. And we might be nodding in the room like, yeah, no, duh, you know, we got to treat these students, you know, with respect. But I travel all over the country doing consulting and program review work around student success efforts, and actually a deficit lens is our position neutral in higher education. We start in so many ways from the assumption that our students are missing something, and that, missing, that, that what they're missing is pathological to who they are. So an asset lens approaches these questions very differently. When we gather first-gen students in a room for an orientation experience, let's say it's before they start their first year, um, how often are we actually using um, a framework of social capital that was grown from marginalized communities? How often are we focusing on community cultural wealth rather than individuated mechanisms of, of social capital that actually come from um, a white normative frame that position our students as lesser than, right? So a community cultural wealth frame is going to ask uh, a set of asset-based questions. You made it thus far. The community you came from, you're from Newark, you're the first in your family to go to college, you have three younger siblings that you raised up, you worked 20 hours a week in high school, and now you're here. What assets do you have? All the things you overcame, they actually tell you a story of resilience, of self-efficacy, of time management, of problem solving, of critical thinking. These are actually the core skills in collegiate success, right? So let's start from the framework that everybody in this room is part of a village of success. And that's a totally different message than I'm going to start by showing you the statistics. Don't be a statistic, right? <laughs> and, 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 you know, I mean, when you say it that way, it sounds like, oh, who would do that? We do this all the time. We don't do it from a place of being anti-student, but we do it because a lot of us who came through success programs in the 70s, 80s, and 90s, that's the way we came in. So this deficit lens is really woven into the fabric of student success work in higher education, and it's something that we have to invert. Uh, we've got to draw from uh, bodies of theory that are, that are well established now that somehow don't seem to make it into the practice around even the way we frame social capital and, and drawing from, from bodies of theory that uh, are more empowering for marginalized group members. Um, and, and I think that we can, from the start, um, create uh, pathways to success that are more empowering than a lot of the models we use right now. I, I want to just um, talk, talk a little bit, maybe not about what happens at the institution, but just about how we, well, yes, about what happens at the institution, but about how we frame, you know, and everything. And I think someone, I can't remember who, and I don't want to attribute it to the wrong person, but mentioned um, just the way systems are designed and who colleges were designed around. And I think in almost every area, whether it's financial aid, whether it's advising, we, it was designed around a time when um, it was not the case that people who were going to college didn't have the resources to go. It was, it was the, you know, the Chris Malloy's were just one in a few. Like, okay, every now and then there's somebody who hasn't been through this before, so we have a special program to help that person. 
And I think now when the majority of students are coming from, we have to completely flip that on its head. I think about this about financial aid. It used to be the case that the majority of people did not need special financial aid. So we had this long, complicated form to figure out. And it's like, if everybody's gonna need it, why the hell do we have like this, you know, thing? just change the whole, so I just feel like we're at a time where we just need to really flip the whole thing on its head. Instead of saying, how do we you know, do this one thing, we need to really re-engineer the entire system. Because when I think about um, you know, students, the, the ways that you uh, expect people to behave in certain areas, it is because not so much that they have like something special about them. So I'm just going to use the President of the United States because I think that's a very good example of where opportunity and talent are not aligned. So uh, <laughs> the systems were actually designed so that it was really, really hard to, for that person to fail. Right, like and he had to try a lot, like to not, you know, you know, he had, he would have to screw up so much. Whereas for other folks, it's like, you know what, you step on the wrong side of the street, oh, you're in the the other can. Okay, you did this, you stayed out too late one night. Okay, now you're you're deemed as a criminal. You did this, like we have these systems that are, and so what I try to think of is at the policy level, how do you change the system so that we're not trying to have some program over here that's real, you know, trying to help what is now the vast majority of people. How do you make this the norm? I think about where I went to college, highly resourced institution, and so that a lot of this we can get into is you know, resources and how we determine those resources at the federal and state level. But when I went to Vanderbilt, and so just a tale of two people, right? I went to high school um, at a, you know, not inner city, but not suburban. It's like, you know, outside of Atlanta, high school, um, if you've seen the movie Drumline, you've seen my high school, basically. Um, it was really fun, but you know, we didn't, we had, I had a college counselor, but we didn't have like intensive, like that person was also doing, dealing with behavioral issues and also dealing with a lot of other stuff. Okay, whatever. But I had parents who went to college and I ended up going to Vanderbilt University, which is a great school, highly resource intensive. As soon as I got there, somebody sat down with me and said, well, what is your major? Okay, these are the classes you can take to, and it, so when I had classmates, who either didn't go to college or went to a college in Georgia um, that now gets a lot of praise, but at the time was not getting a lot of praise, Georgia State. Uh, it was like, we, when we would come back in high school and talk about our college experience, it was like night and day. And they were like, oh man, I apparently I took the wrong English. I'm like, oh, well, how did you take the wrong English? Your advisor didn't tell you what English you were supposed to take? They were like, advisor, what are you talking about? Um, and I'm like, oh, there's like a, when I do my class registration, if I try to type in the wrong thing, it's like error code, error, error. You will not graduate on time if you take this class. And it's like, oh, okay, I guess I can't take Chinese history this year. I'll have to take that, you know? And it's like the system was designed so that it was very difficult for me to fail. It was not that I was so much smarter than my high school classmates. It was that the college I went to made it very difficult. When I went to Harvard to get my master's degree, it was an eye opener um, in terms of, it's really hard to fail out of Harvard Law. Okay, I didn't go to Harvard Law School, but they had a way better um, library, so that was where I <laughs> hung out. And um, it, was, it was, I realized like you actually have to like tell somebody like, I am trying to drop out of this school because if you just stop going to class, they don't care. They're just like, okay, you know, I mean, maybe that's just law school, but you know, they. they you know, don't care. If you um, don't take a class test, somebody reaches out and says, hey, is something going on with you? You know, you didn't come to your test. Yeah. And of course you haven't been at class, but you know you don't have to come to class, but if you need health services or mental health counseling or something's going on, we can provide that for you. And if you still don't do anything, they say, you know what, you just need some time off. We'll give you an incomplete. You're not gonna fail, but you're just incomplete. And when you're ready, you can come back. That is an entirely different system than look to your left, look to your right, one of you isn't gonna be here anymore and it's your fault if it's not you. You know, <laughs> like, so just the systems that we have, I think have to be totally redesigned so that it's not like a special way that you find that you get to the top, but that the norm is that we expect you to graduate and that we're going to support you to get to that place. Yeah, yeah thank you. I, I couldn't agree more, you know, I think, um, Apart from the academics, there's a whole hidden financial system. And she hit it right on with the application for aid. Why can't the students just check a box? Uh, the, the government knows every single thing about you in a millisecond. <laughs> so does Facebook. I mean, there's no reason that uh, they can't do your family estimate. The reason they don't have you check off a box is because too many people would qualify for aid. 
and then uh, it would become too expensive for them. So it, it, the process actually cools out mm -hmm. applicants by making it difficult. Even within the university, students just make poor choices that really impact them financially, and oftentimes because we don't know. You know, nobody told me not to take organic chemistry and physics at the same time. You see, your school would have clicked out. Uh, <laughs> for me, it was a heartbreaking experience, you know, and so students make decisions, well, I'm gonna take an incomplete, or I'm gonna take a W from the course. There's no sense of understanding that financial aid is running a separate policy called satisfactory academic progress. So with financial aid, it doesn't matter if you have a four point, if you've taken incompletes or drop, and you're taking a pace that takes you beyond five years, you're gonna be ineligible for financial aid. And so that's a federal law that we don't know about. We don't often understand the ramifications, the implications of the academic decisions we're making financially. Also, time to degree is expensive. You know, when, when you're in debt and you have to borrow to stay here another year, that's adding to the debt. You know, I, I explained this to my daughter uh, when she was talking about borrowing $20,000 a year. I said, Stacy, you know what happens when you borrow $20,000 a year for four years? I said, nobody will want you. You'll never get married. <laughs> <laughs> you know, <laughs> as soon as they find out you owe $1,800 a month in student loans, they may as well move on to the next person. <laughs> you know. So just imagine two of those people getting married. <laughs> yeah. And that's the situation many of our, our, our students face. It's not a matter of can't do the work, it's a matter of not understanding the ramifications of the decisions we make, both academically, socially, and financially. I don't need a single room, I'd like a single room in the dorm, but that costs $4,000 a year more. Can I really afford to make some of those decisions? And so, how do we get that point across? Uh, this campus has money, but it's broke, right? So, our students at Rutgers receive a billion dollars in financial aid, but we still have a large unmet need mm -hmm. for every student because there is so much need in the student body that we can't fund. There is food insecurity. There are other issues here. When we have a campaign, there's not enough money raised for need-based financial aid, and so that, that poses a big problem. So the hidden curriculum for me is often financial and the ramifications of the decisions we make that make it impossible for some students to finish. And just going off of what each panelist just said, part of the hidden curriculum actually starts in high school, because earlier during breakfast we were talking about the AP gap, mm -hmm. and how like there's a, lot of, there's a lot of students that come from lower social economic status who, have, who at most, at best, have taken honor classes and not AP classes, and they graduated, say, valedictorian, and then they come in here and all, their whole life, people have always been telling them that they're, you know, they're special, they're going to be successful. But they come in here, and their competition is someone who already knows how to work programs like R and Python. And they're just touching the floor. They don't even have their feet wet yet. So that's also like part of the hidden curriculum, that it just doesn't start as soon as you get to college, but rather maybe even in ninth grade, as far back as ninth grade. I just want to jump back in. I was thinking as the other comments, uh, the panelists were sharing about um, um, academic advising. You know, it's, academic advising is probably one of the most powerful levers we have in um, addressing uh, numerous issues from uh, credit productivity issues, which is another way of framing uh, SAP, you know, satisfactory academic progress. So there's all this credit wastage in large public systems where students are taking the wrong classes at the wrong time. Um, and when you're on a financial aid clock, this can be disastrous, particularly for low-income and first-gen students. But, um, and academic advising can also be a key driver in how we work uh, on, the, on the interpersonal piece, right? Uh, when, when you have uh, 40,000 students at a school, the academic advisor might be one of the only adults a student can actually just go see and have a conversation with when they're thinking about dropping out. But when you think about the way we've organized academic advising in most places, and I'm not familiar with Rutgers' academic advising strategy, um, academic advising still represents uh, a previous era of higher education, where the assumption was that every student uh, was coming from uh, a, a much different place of privilege uh, and, and preparation. And so, you know, you, when you look at, if you go to an EAB meeting in DC, or you go to APLU, you go to um, ACE, uh, where university presidents meet, 
we're talking over and over again about the need to move to intrusive or proactive academic advising, where we're not waiting for students to come see the academic advisors. We're not waiting for students to take uh, what we know is a disastrous mix of classes on the front end, but we're actually setting up, I mean, we're, we're in the digital age, right? Why aren't we leveraging um, technology that allows us to manage the way students interact with the university in, in ways that prohibit bad choice making? Right, you, you, you can do this very easily, that if students fill their course cart with a set of courses and we have the analytical capacities and the data science capacities to say, that mix of courses has an 87% probability of failure. You shouldn't do that. Why isn't that kind of informatic popping up and empowering the student to make smarter choices about uh, course selection semester after semester? Um, and so part of, part of this is, when you enter an academic advising space, we always talk about advisor to student ratios, right? And this is, this is a crushing piece of the economics of higher education. And many large state systems, we're at you know, 700 to one. And so then you say intrusive advising and the academic advisors are going, I can't do intrusive advising because I got 700 students in my caseload. When I was working in California prior to coming to Cornell, we had an 1,100 to one academic advisor to student ratio at an access institution, right? Where the average student with 50% first gen students 50% Pell students, right? So there's tremendous need at this institution and an 1,100 to one academic advisor to student ratio. And we were able to use academic advising to drive a dramatic shift in, in graduation rates by changing the technological platforms that advisors were using so that their labor was precise and that students actually were getting the benefits of academic advising without necessarily having to be in front of, of, of a human being. And there, so there's a lot of hope in this, um, in the moment of time we're in and, and I think that uh, universities have to really start to build out their, their data science capacity and uh, really think about the way we empower humans with much more sophisticated tools so that we change the workflow so that we're not sitting there doing hundreds of, you know, um, course selection meetings, but rather um, using, uh, you know, predictive tools to actually work with highest needs students in holistic and intrusive ways. Uh, and I could go on and on about this, but I think that for those of you who are in these kinds of spaces, this is the direction you want to take the discourse. Um, and if you're still using a passive academic advising model, it's time for you to, to throw up the red flag and start alerting your institution to the fact that that, that model underserves our highest needs students. Thank you. And, and related to that on the, the structure piece, uh, institutions have to look at the policies they have in place that can really have a disparate impact on low-income students. So, for example, uh, registration for courses, if that is so directly connected to the status of a student's bill that they can't up register, then you have situations where students, because they're trying to get the money together, they can't register early. They end up then not being able to register for the courses that they need. Zakia mentioned the example of you know, having friends at Georgia State who took the wrong English. That's essentially another half, at least another half semester that student is there, right? It's very unlikely that that student took the full load they were planning to take the following semester plus the English they didn't take, right? It's very likely that moved, everything shifted. So these, these policies where students one, because they don't know, or because they can't register in a timely manner, it, it adds time. And as we know, the time adds cost, another year of aid, uh, as well as another year of delayed earnings, and all that is a formula for disaster. Thank you. Um, so, so that we stay on time, uh, we're approaching the end. Um, there's so many more questions that we can ask the panelists. I just wanted to give you maybe a minute um, to, to just, if there's one thing you can challenge our audience to do, because we have students, we have faculty, we have staff and administrators. If there's one thing you can challenge them to do based upon this conversation we are having, what is that? What does it take away? When they walk out of this door, what is it that you would challenge them to do to forward the course of first generation students, low income students? Well, for, for us, I think it's a big challenge in a place like Rutgers, New Brunswick, that's so large and so confusing oftentimes and so overwhelming. So my challenge is, is how we change our paradigms, you know, how we change the way we think about service. Um, 
So we, we'll be trying something pretty dramatic uh, next year and doing away with financial aid office, uh, front end and records and registration, and student accounting, all the separate offices that students have to go to to create a new uh, virtual, almost uh, one-stop uh, facility here in New Brunswick. That really will change almost everything we do in terms of delivering services. Because when you have an issue, you don't care if it's student accounting or you don't care if it's financial aid. You just need the problem solved. And so we've, we've built offices on traditional walls because we needed files and we needed these things, but we don't need that anymore. I mean, we have lots of virtual systems, as you just heard about, that we should be using more efficiently. So it's, it's, a, it's a great experiment next year as this facility opens to, to change the way we deliver services to students. So it'll be either very, very good or very, very bad. So if, I, if I'm not here uh, on the next year's panel, then, then, then you kind of know how to come down. Uh, I, I'm actually really excited about it because it gives us an opportunity to just think everything we do in a different way. We had our first eight staff members yesterday in this new facility. They just started training. And I think next year it's going to be pretty exciting for students. OK, thank you. And uh, for the students, what I'd like to, like, especially for the students rather, what I'd like to leave them off with is take initiative as much as you can. You know, go to office hours. Uh, and there's, other, there's also other, I guess, advi academic advising you could get from p people like in the SAE office and it's not just, and depart in your department. And also, like, what a, what a good friend of mine who's actually in the audience had told me once, because oftentimes we get bogged up on the fact that maybe I'm a little bit in over my head. But what I like to always remember is, if other people have done it, why can't I? And that's, that's, the, word, that's the words that I've always tried to run with and try to remember. Um, I, I love this audience, though, because every time we say anything, you all are affirming and clapping. <laughs> <laughs> so um, so the, the, I, I'm actually going to kind of cheat and do two things that I would um, have you take away. One would be. Um, just paying attention to, so a lot of times we talk about uh, policy and resource constraints and things like that, which are very real. So if you're an administrator or faculty or staff, um, please pay attention to the federal and state policy and become an advocate. And not just, you know, not just saying, you know, spend more money on this, on TAG or EOF. Those are good things to say. But focus one level ab above, because I can tell you, what happens is there's a number that we decide we can spend on all programs. And if, you're, if you miss the policy conversation that's about that number, so at the federal level, it's when we were fighting about the deficit and whether we're going to cut taxes, which reduces the amount of money that we have to spend on programs, or to cut, you know, or to cut the overall level. That seems like it's so in another place, but I can tell you what happens when advocates are out of that conversation, then you've already seeded okay, well, we have, you know, $30 billion left to deal with, and it's split between Head Start, students with disabilities, um, SNAP, Supplemental Nutrition Assistance, that's basically food stamps, and all of the other social programs. So once the, what, what I experience is, once the advocates for these programs get involved, it's, it's almost too late, because now you're, you're saying basically, okay, we should spend money on college and not on students learning to read in Head Start. We should spend money on college and not on poor mothers getting food assistance. We should spend money on college and not on, you know, students with disabilities getting the services they need. And really, that is, it's, and I used to see it in D.C., and it was so sad. I mean, and I was the person that was trying to advocate in the White House to spend money on college. But I can tell you, sometimes it feels pretty bad. Like, it's like, I wish you had come, like, three weeks ago when John Boehner was in here saying that we should have cut that. Like, that would have been the time to say, no, don't do that. <laughs> like, but I think sometimes we feel like, that's not my lane. I'm going to stay in my lane, and my lane is here to advocate for TRIO. My lane is not to talk about, you know, economic policy. Your lane is to talk about economic policy, because if that gets decided, it just, you know, you, you know, so please, please, please pay attention to the policies that are happening at that level. And to that um, end, I would be remiss if I didn't announce that tomorrow we are releasing a state plan for higher education, the first one that we've had in 
probably, um, I don't know, at, at least a decade, um, if it doesn't snow and keep us away. <laughs> but um, we're at Rutgers Camden. It'll be live streamed. You can see it at nj.gov slash higher education. It's going to be a student-focused uh, plan. I think a lot of the things that we talked about today should be um, coming through in that. So I would just ask that you all kind of take a look. And if it seems like something that um, is, is a direction in which the state should be moving, say so. We'll have a lot of opportunities for a public engagement. So I'm going to cheat also. <laughs> to, I have something I want to say to the administrators and something to the students, OK? So to the, the administrators, the, the focus for me as it relates to this work is listen, empathize, strategize. Listen to the students, empathize with the students, and then strategize about how to address their issues and concerns. Um, I, 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 I think about something that I read the other day, so I want to bring it up. Uh, I'm going to pick on Yale. I don't think, I hope that, that doesn't... Totally matter. pick on Yale. Totally I approve. Um, so some of you might have seen, New York Times had a story a couple of days ago, three young women students, undergraduate students at Yale. Uh, they're suing the university, essentially claiming that the university permits a, uh, a fraternity uh, culture that is both discriminatory uh, and harmful uh, uh, to women. What really struck me uh, um, amongst a number of things, and having you know, been on a lot of campuses, I understand what they're talking about, is the response from one of the Yale administrators. It, uh, apparently, this is not totally news to Yale. So they had actually recently conducted a review and a study of uh, fraternity life you know, on campus. And it, it really struck me that one of the, I don't remember the name, administrators, at the end of the report said they were appalled by what they learned about uh, what happens in fraternity culture and life, um, and their words to concern female students was, don't go. If you're worried about your safety at a fraternity party, don't go. And it struck me as very tone deaf because essentially you recruit students to a campus for the whole experience, both academic and social, but when you are bothered by an aspect of that, you respond as if it is this arbitrary thing. Uh, that's like students complaining about food on campus and your response being, don't eat, right? It shows a lack of empathizing. And if you don't empathize, you can't understand and you can't properly strategize, uh, which is why the young women resorted to suing, because the institution showed that while they listened, they did the study, their response didn't show that they empathized and that they were really serious. So listen, empathize, strategize. For the students, how many students here, just so I'm clear? I never assume anyone's a student. OK, good, good. Glad you're here. Think like a boss, OK? Whether you're not just like an employee or a consumer. You know, one of the things we talk about is how much Students, especially if you're from low-income family, how much you have to work. That's a part of it. But think like a boss while you're working, one, two, three, whatever jobs. And here, understand, that doesn't mean going to the job thinking you know everything <laughs> and trying to tell people what to do. It means learn about the dollars behind that business. If you're working the front counter, whether it's a fast food or a retail, Find out, is this a public or private traded company? What are the annual earnings? How much do this, does the CEO and the senior management earn? And what exactly do they do? So that you can begin to connect what you're doing at the front end part with how it relates to what probably is a multi-million dollar business. Same thing as a consumer. You consume music, you consume products, understand the dollars behind that. You know, sometimes uh, us administrators, we sit on the stage and we say, oh, these, part of the problem, these kids, they want to buy Air Jordans and cell phones and all this fancy stuff. I understand wanting to have things when, and I just say to students, understand the dollars behind that. Why one product costs more than another and what are the earnings? You know, right now, Apple is this billion dollar company, right? 
because they can sell an iPhone for $1,000. But there's a, there's a business structure behind that, that even if you aren't interested in that type of business, it's helpful to changing your way of thinking so that when you leave this campus and walk across with that diploma, you enter the workforce understanding how businesses work, both nonprofit and for profit. Um, so I'll, I'll, um, my remarks are for the, the staff and faculty and administrators in the room who, um, who work on student success issues, which I expect is the majority of this room, right? When you do events like this, you're preaching to the choir. So uh, that's probably 90% of the room. I doubt anybody showed up today like, I don't like first gen students. Um, <laughs> Uh, but, uh, so let me preach to the choir a little bit here. Um, you know, in, in moments of great activism on college campuses uh, around social justice in the late 1960s, in the early to mid 1980s, and starting again in 2014, 2015, one of the patterns we've seen in these moments of cyclical activism is that students who are the drivers of the change, right, um, f have formed what would have been called in the 60s and, and in the 80s reading groups, and um, in the, 2000, you know, the 2015s uh, online communities, to conscientize themselves, to empower themselves with a set of intellectual tools that have driven their activism. So in the late 1960s, the reading circles were around new social theory, right? People were reading um, uh, about um, uh, race consciousness, um, Marxism, uh, uh, second wave feminism, um, labor economics, and they were then bringing a set of concerns, demands, and actions against their institutions to try and push their institutions towards uh, becoming more inclusive and more just places. The same thing happened again in the 1980s. Uh, there was tremendous activism on college campuses at that time, and much of it was driven by student activists who were part of reading circles. And they were looking at liberation theology, and they were looking at um, you know, neo-Marxist movements, they were looking at uh, you know, emergent uh, critical race theories and uh, critical legal studies. And these epistemologies formed the basis for a new form of activism. Um, and the same thing happened again uh, in 2015 um, with students, uh, you know, gathering a social consciousness from Ferguson, from Baltimore, and pulling that into college campuses and, and asking some very important questions around uh, racial inclusion, uh, sexual safety and sexual violence, um, trans inclusion, and a variety of other issues. And so there's been this really vibrant connection. If you're like, where is he going with this? Hang tight, hang tight. Um, there's been this really vibrant connection between the literature, whether that literature is in physical books or online, of social justice, of critical theory, and activism. Um, in the student success space, there has not been nearly as vibrant a connection between the literature and our practice. Uh, most of the places I visit, when I talk to the people who are in the trenches doing empowerment work with low-income and first-gen students, and I ask them what the last peer-reviewed journal article they read that has informed their practice, they are not able to answer the question. Well, I did my master's back in the 90s. They made me read, you know, okay, this is actually a living field where research is coming out all the time that demonstrates the viability of interventions empirically but we're not taking the best from that research. The, the right hand is not talking to the left. This is a classic problem in higher education where the research enterprise is not affecting the practice enterprise. And so the term praxis, right, the action driven from theory, is not really happening in a vibrant way in the student success space. Most of us who work in marginalized communities do a lot of things the same as we did them 10 years ago. We call it tradition. If you haven't changed what you do in 10 years, you're probably not doing the right thing. So we need to form, just like student activists do, just like radical agitators do, just like social justice change agents do, in the student success space, we have to have reading circles. We have to be part of theoretical communities that are actually looking at the literature and saying, well, there was a multi-institutional study in North Carolina that proved 
that this form of high impact practice in freshman biology classrooms changes the outcomes for black students and low income students. Why don't we do an inclusive pedagogy training for, for biology instructors, right? This, there's tons of research on this, right? So that, that would be my prescriptive advice, you know? Uh, and I, 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 I think that we have, to, we have to model a better way of doing this. We've had passion and commitment for a long time. The outcomes um, lag. They lag behind our passion and commitment. And one of the reasons why, there are some superstructural reasons why, right? I mean, we live in a society engineered against the upward mobility of disenfranchised people. But on top of that, those of us in the trenches are not fighting with the sharpest tools. And marginalized and vulnerable people deserve for us to be using the best tools available to, move, to be making change on their behalf. Okay, so we have about 15 minutes for a Q&A period. Student Access and Educational Equity Central team to come up here, to join behind me. I want to, and I'm going to ask um, our Are You First students to stand up because we're going to you can uh, come over here for a second if we if they have a, something they want to share with you all. And before we do some closing, we're going to ask for uh, 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 the student. Where are the students in the audience? Where are all our students? Can you make your way down here as well? The students, come on down here. We wanna, we wanna, we wanna make your way with our panelists because we're gonna take a picture. We wanna celebrate you and your success being here. Come on down here. Come on down, students. Oh, I see a few students. I wanna, um, I wanna thank each and every one of you um, for the work that you all do and your participation today that it was informative but also giving us the guidance that we need at Rutgers. Uh, our office and undergraduate academic affairs are gonna be working with the schools to redefine some of the work that we do around student access and educational equity and working on this Are You First initiative because we believe that it is very, will be very successful. Uh, one of the things I wanna to say to all of you, you're gonna hear a lot more of this central team, Sabrina and London and a lot of the team, Cora and Eddie and folks that are here, uh, Jana and the staff, who else? It's Jess Marie. Their central team, it's about a team of five or six who work collaboratively uh, on behalf of the institution to put a lot of these programs together. And you did great work. And I want to thank you and thank the students for working. So you all did a great job, Justin. Uh, but we want to grow this program. We want to grow these initiatives. And you're going to see a lot more in the coming year or so of us being a lot more intrusive on campus working with the faculty and staff. Because I think, as you said, we've got to do a lot more. And it's a lot of preaching to the choir here, because I can see some of the, we have some folks that are out there that still don't get it. And that's a fact. That's a fact here at Rutgers. I can say it. I've been here a while, so I get it. I've been a student here. I get it. Some folks that just don't get it. And if we're going to be better, we're going to have to get it. And so we're going to do everything we can to get it and use the folks with what we learned today and these fine folks and the folks in the audience to do that. So uh, I want to thank you. I'm going to bring up the director of the student support services program that has done great expansions under his leadership and the director of our newly formed uh, Paul Robeson Leadership Institute to bring us closing and then we ask that you stand by uh, for a photo. Did I miss something? I, I know they have something. To, go ahead, give it to the, they have something to give to the panelists. Go ahead, go ahead. Thank you. Mr. Moore. Good morning. So, in thinking about the dialogue amongst our panelists, panelists this morning, I want to encourage some action items and next steps to ensure that we have some collective thought regarding supports for first-gen students and it becomes a habit for their progress. Some objectives should be to identify institutional access supports to create and or increase collaborative systems of approach and student support and also determine which institutional stakeholders' involvement can best benefit your first-gen student's success. First, determine how much of a priority is the success of first-gen students on your campus. Identify invested stakeholders that hold influence but are also willing to work in the trenches and communicate the need for first-gen support both upwards and outwards is critical. Who are those individuals that you feel would be best positioned to, to support the needs and interests of your first-gen students? Next, 
Think about what you would consider as a key principle to develop an intentional and systematic culture to support first-gen student success on your respective campuses.